had the privilege of visiting uh, Cambodia earlier in the year with Brad and we visited some of our missionary friends. We were only there for a few days but it was a real encouragement to us to see the work that the Lord is doing in that part of the world. And um, some of what we're looking at tonight, we'll, we'll touch on uh, some of that and I intend to use some illustrations from uh, the mission field to really encourage us. But one thing that I was reminded of in, uh, in going there is just how wealthy we are in Australia. We are so rich. We have so much. We, we, have, we have so many possessions. We have houses. We have cars. We have jobs. And if we don't have jobs, we have a good welfare system. We have great hospitals and medical services that are amongst the best in the world. And really, we are so blessed. We have so much. And I'm reminded of a quote, and I've shared it before, from Leonard Ravenhill talking about America, where he says, we are so rich in this country that we flush our toilets with drinking water. And it's so true. And, and when you see a country like Cambodia, it really puts things in, in perspective that for the most part, they don't have running water. And where they do have running water, it's not safe to drink. And yet in, this, in our country, we are so wealthy. We went as part of our, our visit to Cambodia. They took us to a remote village. It was a three hour trip there and three hours back. And uh, part of while we were there, they, they put on a banquet for us uh, and we felt very, very honoured. Uh, they had gone to what appeared to be a, a lot of effort in putting on what would have been for them a really nice feast. But the, the food, when they brought the food out, and I, I can't describe a lot of it. Um, it, it was really, it's, not, it's food that we wouldn't eat here. And I, I tried one of the dishes that was described as a chicken and eggplant, and I'm not sure it was either. <laughs> and every mouthful I was praying to the Lord, Lord, please let this food go down and stay down. And it's food that we would, if we had this in our home, we'd, we'd tip it in the bin and we'd go and get takeaway. One of, the, one of the dishes was a big bowl of snails. And one of the Cambodians was eating these snails. He had a toothpick and he was hoeing into these snails. And I've shared this story with a couple of you. But he was so happy eating these snails. And he looked at Brad and me and he said, you know, these snails are so good. These are the good <coughs> ones. We get these from the well rather than the sewer. And there was nothing he could say that would make me want to eat them. <laughs> but it just made me realise, you know, we, we have so much here. And these people were so poor but had such joy in the Lord. And it's a real paradox, isn't it, that, that we in this country who have so much so often seem to have so little. And some people, like these people in Cambodia who have so little, really seem to have so much. And this evening we are going to consider what I've described as the poverty of worldly wealth compared with the riches of Christ. The poverty of worldly wealth compared with the riches of Jesus Christ. You see, worldly riches are deceitful. They're deceitful because they distract us from God, don't they? In this country, people have so much that nobody needs God. We're so blessed. We can look after ourselves. We become self-reliant. And through history, it's often periods of depression, periods of poverty, periods of war, where people turn to the Lord. But in our society we have so much and sharing the gospel in Australia is just so hard because no one needs God. The, the blessings that God has given to us in this country distract us from the one that has given them to us. We think we don't need God. And that was the warning that God gave to his own people when he brought them into the promised land. And scripture tells us in a number of places, Deuteronomy 6, Deuteronomy 8, for example, where God is about to bring his people into the promised land and he says, be careful that when you go in there and you have your big houses and you have your large crops and you have your herds that are increasing and multiplying and that you are so blessed, be careful that you do not forget God. And they did, of course. And we can too. And it's, the, the, the blessing of worldly wealth is deceitful. It takes our eyes off the things of eternity and we focus on that which we have now. Worldly riches are also deceitful because they're only temporary. And when we look at them in the light of eternity, they are really so worthless. But they, they take so much of our time and our efforts. 
This is illustrated so well with the man that comes to Jesus, the rich man, and he asks Jesus, what can I do to get eternal life? He's a man that had so much wealth, he had his life together, he didn't even sin. At least he didn't think he did. And he says to Jesus, what can I do to get eternal life? And Jesus looked at this man and saw in his heart he was a man that loved his wealth, that for him it was a god, it was an idol. And Jesus saw that for this man it was stopping him from coming to God and Jesus said to him, you need to sell all that you've got and give it to the poor and then you can come and follow me. And the man went away very sad because he had great wealth. And Jesus said to his disciples, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. He said, it is easier for a camel to go, to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. Beloved, do not let worldly riches take your eyes off God. May we not be so distracted by the blessings that God gives us that we forget the one that has given them to us. May we see the deceitfulness of being caught up in the pursuit of wealth that we don't take our eyes off God. Worldly riches are deceitful and can blind us from seeing God. Now that's not to say we can't have worldly wealth. We can have earthly riches as long as they do not have us. You can have earthly riches as long as the earthly riches don't have you or don't have your heart. You see, riches themselves are not the problem. They're a gift from God. They're a blessing. The problem is not money. The problem is love of money. It's like what Jesus says in our reading, verse 24, if you've got it in front of you, where he says, No one can serve two masters, since either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. And what Jesus is saying is that your heart cannot be divided. You cannot really love God and at the same time love the world, the things of the world, wealth as a God, that that will be your God if that's where your heart is. That's what he's saying. But there are examples in scripture of people who had great wealth, that were truly blessed by God in, in material things, but they understood in the right perspective uh, where their treasure was and where their heart was. Perhaps the best example of this is Job. Job was a man who had great wealth. He's described as the richest man in the East and all that he had was taken from him. His wealth was taken, his health was taken and his good wife comes to him and says, why don't you curse God and die? You see, for her it, was, it must have been about the wealth and once he lost his wealth, what was the point? But for Job, his answer is to his wife in Job chapter 2, he says, you speak as a foolish woman speaks. Should we accept only good from God and not adversity? And throughout all this, Job did not sin in what he said. See, he understood, he accepted good from God. He accepted the blessings of wealth. But he remembered the one that gave it to him. And his love was for the Lord and not the blessings of the Lord. So that when the Lord took them away, his love for the Lord didn't change because it wasn't linked to the things that God had given him. It's like Job says in chapter 1, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I will leave this life. The Lord gives, and the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That Job had, the Lord gave, and he received it gratefully with thanks. But his love and his hope was in the Lord, not in the things that he was given. So that when it was taken away, he could still say, Blessed be the Lord. Another example is the Apostle Paul where he tells us in Philippians 4 that he knows what it is to have a lot and he knows what it is to have little. He knows what it is to have an abundance and to have poverty. He says, I've learned the secret to be content in all circumstances. He says, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So that for Paul, like with Job, when he had an abundance, his hope wasn't in that, his comfort his strength was in Christ, so that when he was in poverty as well, his strength was in Christ. His contentment was in Christ, the one who gives and the one who takes. Brothers and sisters, do not let your possessions possess you. Do not let your possessions possess your heart. And we must not let our riches rule our heart. 
And in fact, in order to be truly rich, in a way, we must actually be poor. We must be poor in order to be truly rich. You see, the gospel is countercultural. In Matthew chapter 5, the chapter before the section that we read, Jesus didn't say, Blessed are the wealthy, blessed are those who have lots of possessions. He says, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, we need to recognise that all we have in this world is really nothing in light of eternity. That we are poor because we are dependent upon God. We have a, a, a humility that we come to God knowing that nothing that we have really is of any worth except for the Lord himself. Like Paul says in another place in 2 Corinthians 6, he says, We have nothing, yet possess everything. And it's that idea of perhaps having nothing in this world or at least nothing that, that we hold on to, yet we possess all things because we possess eternal things. I, I want to share a couple of photos, thank you Brandon, from our time in Cambodia. These people are so poor. This is the village that we went to, which I mentioned, uh, and the people there, there's 400 families living in this, this village. It's in the middle of nowhere. It has no electricity, it has no water, it has no roads really. It floods three or four months of the year and you can only get there by tractor. And there's 400 families living there which are mostly ex-military or disabled people. These are people who are so poor and so needy. And there's these 400 families in this village and the missionaries that we visited are reaching out to this village. It's one of many things that they do, but they've got some Christian families living in there, sharing the gospel. These are some of their houses. You know, they look like sheds. This is where people live and the roofs are made of different things. Whatever they can find, some are tin, some are straw, some are tarps. You can see there's, there's nothing. They've got some chickens running around, not particularly healthy looking ones. Got some water pots to catch the water from the roof. These people really have, have nothing and these missionaries have built a school there because there's no education. The nearest school is 30 kilometres away but 30 kilometres coming from here is impossible to get to. So they've built a school and it's run by teachers who get paid zero dollars a year. There's no money, they can't afford to pay a teacher so people are volunteering their time to teach the local children. There's 90 children that come permanently and there's another 70 or so that come on a part-time basis because they have to help their parents work to earn, uh, to be able to survive. But there's 90 children that come permanently and it, it, it's a Christian school. They teach education to the village children but every day they're teaching the Bible and they're teaching the good news of Jesus. It doesn't have any walls as you can see and there's another three classrooms about to be built. Uh, here it is. Uh, and then uh, what we have here we, we, the reason we went to this village, uh, incidentally, is because the, the Langwarren Church generously donated some money and there was no toilet in the entire village. And so with some of the money from Langwarren, they built uh, a, a double toilet so that the students could use a toilet and, and the rest of the village as well. You know, they really have nothing. And it's not a toilet like a toilet that we would have. But what these guys are doing here, these sticks, are they're, they're, they're built, getting materials to build their church because there are families coming to Christ in this village and they have nowhere to worship. So they've got some big sticks and these guys here are chatting about whether they're going to build the church up the top here, there's actually a, a bit of a hill, or whether to build it down in that open space. And they decided to build it at the top here so that when it floods for three or four months of the year they can hopefully still have a place to worship. And they've got these big sticks and they'll build it and they'll have a, a roof of some sort I don't think they'll have any walls. They might, but they won't have four. They won't have a floor. If they have chairs, they won't be nice, comfortable chairs like the ones we have. They won't have a sound system. They won't have air conditioning. It's very hot there throughout the year. But this is their church because these people have Jesus Christ and they want a place to come together to worship him. And so they'll have their, their church. And I was standing at one point in that sunny spot there with Brad and we were looking at, at these, these people talk about this church and I was thinking about you know, our church, that for the last seven or eight years we've been thinking about building a bigger auditorium for us so that we can be a bit more comfortable, so that we don't have to put the seats out in the foyer as often as we would like. 
and uh, I was thinking that you know some of the numbers that have been thrown around are 1.5 million dollars, you know, give or take. But that's 1.5 million dollars could go an awful long way in a place like Cambodia. These people have nothing, but they have the Lord Jesus Christ, beloved. May we see the poverty in our possessions. May we see the worthlessness in the things of the world. And so look upward to Christ and heavenly treasure. May we not be distracted by the things of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, but may we see the heavenly treasure of Jesus Christ. You see, we can be poor in this world like these people. They had nothing, but they were so rich because they had heavenly treasure, which is far better. You see, heavenly riches are far better than earthly riches. Heavenly riches are eternal. It lasts forever. It doesn't wear out. It doesn't get destroyed. Have a look in our reading, verses 19 and 20, where Jesus said, Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. You see, we can have the best. We can spend all our money and buy nice things, but no matter what we buy or how much we spend, it's not going to last. We could go out tomorrow and buy the nicest brand new car and spend all our money. And the moment we drive it out of the car yard, it loses some of its value. In five years' time, it becomes a pretty average car. And in 20 years' time, it's a piece of junk. It's not worth anything. So no matter what we buy, no matter how much we have, it's not going to last. It's temporary. The things of the world are temporary. But verse 20, Jesus says, But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves don't break in and steal. There is a better treasure in heaven that doesn't wear out. And the other thing is that we can't take our earthly riches with us, no matter how much we have. It's like the parable Jesus tells of the man who had a, an amazing crop that he couldn't fit it in his barn. So he tore down his barn and built a bigger one so we could put all this stuff in there. And God says to that man, you fool, tonight your life will be required of you. You see, he couldn't take any of that stuff with him and neither can we. And you see, eternal riches are better than earthly riches when we think about the riches of heaven itself. This is illustrated in Revelation chapter 20 and 21 where we see the contrast. Because if we don't have heavenly treasure, our eternity is in hell forever under the judgment of God. And in Revelation 20 we see that those whose names are not written in the book of life are thrown into the lake of fire for eternal judgment. And then in chapter 21 we see the new heaven and the new earth. We see all tears are wiped away from every eye, that there's no more sickness, there's no more suffering, there's no hurt or sadness or sorrow, that God will dwell with his people and be our God and we will be his Amen. people. We see that the eternal riches are so much better than those of the world. The Bible gives us a summary of some very faithful people from history and it's in Hebrews chapter 11. It's often described as the spiritual hall of fame. And many of these people of faith understood this difference between eternal treasure and earthly treasure. Have a look in uh, chapter 11 from verse 13 to 16. It says, These all died in faith, although they had not received the things that were promised. But they saw them from a distance, greeted them, and confessed that they were foreigners and temporary residents on the earth. You see, when you have treasure in heaven, when the Lord Jesus Christ is preparing a mansion for you, in heaven where the streets are paved with gold, nothing that you have on this earth you will consider to be your home. We are temporary residents on the earth. Verse 14, Now those who say such things make it clear that they are seeking a homeland. If they were thinking about where they came from, they would have had an opportunity to return. But they now desire a better place, a heavenly one. Therefore God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. May we, like these giants of the faith, live in light of eternity. May we see that what we have here is temporary, and may we seek the things of eternity. Let us seek the better treasure, the treasure of heaven. And as we seek the better treasure, 
we understand that the best treasure is Jesus Christ himself. The riches of knowing Jesus Christ is worth everything. Knowing Jesus Christ as our Saviour and our Lord is worth everything. It's worth everything in this life. It's not about health, wealth and prosperity. That's a, that's a lie from hell. The Christian life is a life of suffering. It's a life of cross-carrying. But it's a life of eternal joy. It's a life where we have the peace that surpasses our understanding. Jesus said in John 10, 10, that I have come, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy, but I have come that they may have life and have it abundantly. In Christ we have true riches in this life. King, Solom uh, King Solomon was a man who had great wealth. He had great wisdom. He had many women. And he found that in all his pursuits in the earth, he could not find true meaning in his life. And in the book of Ecclesiastes, which is his study on, on this exact thing, his conclusion is that all these things are a grasping for the wind, a vapour. You can never grab onto it. It's meaningless, vanity. And he says the hope in this life is in fearing the Lord and following him. Knowing Christ as our Saviour and our Lord, knowing that we do not deserve the riches of heaven, but God gives it to us by his grace that we deserve judgment because of our sin. We are storing up rubbish on earth, but God gives us the gift of eternal treasure in Christ, undeserved, and we receive it by faith. And receiving Christ in this life is worth everything. It's also worth everything in the life to come, in eternity. Jesus said in John 14, 6, that I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no one comes to the Father. No one comes to heaven. No one comes to receive eternal riches but through me. And the, and the well-known verse in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life, and that those that do not believe in the Son of God are condemned already because we don't deserve the eternal treasures. We deserve eternal judgment. Jesus explains this in some very short parables. I think they are, well they must be the shortest parables he ever tells in Matthew 13. And I think they're so short because it's just so simple. He says in Matthew 13 verse 44 The kingdom of heaven is like treasure buried in a field that a man found and reburied. Then in his joy he goes and sells everything he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant in search of fine pearls. When he found one priceless pearl, he went and sold everything he had and bought it. Jesus is saying that the pursuit of the kingdom of God is worth everything. Everything we have in this life, whatever it costs, whatever it takes, it's worth pursuing the kingdom of God. Some people get this parable upside down and they think that we are the pearl of great price and that God gave everything to get us. And in one sense, yes, Jesus gave up his life to pay for our sins and give us eternal treasure. But that's not what these parables are talking about. These are saying that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that is worth everything to get. The Apostle Paul, before he came to Christ, had a lot. He had a lot in the ways of the world. Not necessarily wealth, but the principle is the same. He had so much in the ways of the world. And when he came to Christ, he tells us in Philippians 3 that all that he had, he considered to be rubbish, or the word is dung, compared with the surpassing greatness of knowing Jesus Christ. And he says that my goal, my goal in life is to be found in him and to obtain the resurrection of the dead. That he realised in Christ that all that he had was worthless, it was done and his one pursuit was for the kingdom of God, for Jesus Christ that he would be found in him and have eternal treasure. May our life's ambition also be to know Jesus Christ. Let us not get distracted by the things that really are worthless and may we look to Christ and seek to be found in him. The riches of knowing Christ as our Saviour and our Lord is worth everything. 
and it's worth telling everyone. This is the last point. The riches of knowing Christ is worth telling everyone. You see, this message is good news. That's what the word gospel means. It means good news. It's good news that we don't need to get to heaven on our own goodness because our own goodness is worthless. It's good news that Christ died for our sins and that we can trust him, that he offers us the eternal riches in heaven through him and what he has done for us, that we receive it through faith. It's good news. It says in Romans, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. It's a message worth telling. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is the only really good news. For there is no other name given among men by which we must be saved. And we see this in Cambodia. It's a message worth proclaiming. Cambodia is a country that has suffered so much. Yes, they're in so much poverty at the moment. In the mid to late 70s, they were affected by the evil of the Khmer Rouge. Uh, I, I was even in court on Friday and I was talking to a Cambodian interpreter who was there and, and she lived through that period in Cambodia. And just the, the atrocities, the tragedy that these people have lived through, the evil that they have seen in the world. And yet, when they come to Christ... They transform, lives are transformed. I've shared before that when uh, these missionary friends of ours testify that when the gospel comes to a community and families get saved, it transforms the whole community. That they no longer hurt each other. They don't abuse one another. They stop neglecting their children. They stop stealing. And their lives are transformed by the power of the gospel. They seek the treasure of heaven and they, they desire to make that known to other Cambodians. The gospel transforms and it's a message worth proclaiming and the gospel spreads even in the midst of such poverty. And I just want to share a few more photos. Thank you, Brandon. One of the outreach ministries of these missionaries is to go to the remote villages and share the gospel with the children. And they currently reach 72,000 children every week in a village Bible club where these people who have been touched by the gospel, not the Americans, the Cambodians, that they go out on their motorbikes into these far places where no one else will go and they bring the children from the village and they teach them from the Bible. They teach them a story from the Bible. They teach them to sing the songs about God. They teach them to pray and then they do a colouring in. They bring paper and crayons. These are people that are so poor they don't have education. They don't go to school. They don't have paper. They don't have crayons to colour with. And these people come and they bring them a colouring in that they can do of a story that they've learnt from the Bible. And the kids colour it in and they go home to their families and they show their, their parents these pictures and they share the story from the Bible with their parents and families have been saved. 72,000 children every week that hear the gospel. This is one that we saw when we were there earlier in the year. These are people singing. They're singing, God is so good. This is them praying. The adults, there's over 100,000 adults that have been transformed by the gospel that are meeting every week, mostly in house churches and in some areas where there's enough house churches and if they can afford it, they might build a church. It won't be as nice as this one, but somewhere where they can gather on a Sunday to worship. Over 100,000 adults that have been touched by the gospel. When the, these American missionaries came to Cambodia 18 years ago, they had zero Cambodian pastors that could share the gospel work with them. And their heart was to reach out and disciple and evangelise the locals so that they would go and share with their own people. And now, 18 years later, they have 600 Cambodian pastors who dedicate their lives to sharing the good news of the gospel. They go into the far places of the country. They get paid... I think about $20 a month, which is not enough to live off. It helps pay for some of the petrol that they put in their motorbike so that they can go. But they don't do it for worldly wealth. They don't do it for treasure. They do it for eternal treasure. So they can share the good news of the gospel. And every one of those 600 pastors has a Timothy. They have a disciple, somebody else who has been touched by the gospel that desires to learn how to share the good news with other people. It's house-to-house -house evangelism. They're taking the message of the gospel house-to-house. -house. It's not big crusades. 
house to house, person to person, sharing the good news of the gospel, the eternal treasure of Jesus Christ. Just last year they had nearly 20,000 new believers added to the kingdom as they confessed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Saviour. These are people who have, thank you very much, such poverty, and yet they have such treasure in heaven. Let us also spread the good news of the heavenly treasure that is found in Jesus Christ. May we pursue and proclaim the eternal riches of Christ rather than the deceitful riches of the world. How hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. We are so rich in this country. We are so blessed. And how hard it is for an Australian to enter the kingdom of heaven. We are so distracted in our society by worldly wealth that we take our eyes off God. But what about us? Are we storing up treasure on earth or are we storing up treasure in heaven? May we live in light of eternity, seeking the eternal treasure that is found in Christ, knowing him as our saviour and the Lord of our life. And may we take encouragement from God's people in Cambodia. May our lives too be lived pursuing and proclaiming the eternal riches of Christ rather than the deceitful riches of the world. Let us pray.